Uh, do, do, do. Okay, uh, welcome everyone to the Recruitment Marketing Machine Online Summit. And actually, this is the live version, okay? I know you guys have all thought, oh yeah, you know, Ian Brody is there and Terry Edwards has been there and, and they've been talking and David Walsh has been there and he's been talking. We pre-recorded them not that massively long ago, um, but these guys are actually real in the room now. I won't get them to hold up uh, copies of the Sun newspaper with the date on and, and the time or anything, but they really are live. Um, and if you I'm want to... I'm trying not to move now just to... <laughs> just <like that>. <laughs> <laughs> We, we've got a little cardboard cutout of Ian Brody in the top right-hand thing, but it's amazingly <laughs> lifelike. I, I, I love it. Um, and, uh, yeah, in fact, just to test that it's live, let's do something. Look, I've got People... a look. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, that's uncanny. It really is. It really is. It's Anton Deck in that thing. <laughs> you have to send me that to me, Ian. I love that. <laughs> Um, just to show that it's really true and live, what I'd like any of the people that are watching this to do, and I can see that there's more of you in the room, which is great. Welcome, welcome. Um, just clap. So in the bottom right-hand side of each of these guys' uh, photographs are two little hand things. It just says that you can see them, you maybe like them, or you're a fan of them. Just clap away. And then the more claps you give them, the more love they feel. Okay? So... <laughs> yeah it's good i love it i'm clapping away it's like yeah let's get david in because only david's just joined us we need to give him some claps and some love in the room. <laughs> okay so look let me uh the first thing i want to do is um is welcome everybody this is my first blab i know for terry it's his first blab for ian i know he's done a couple of these uh that makes him the expert in the room david have you done more blabs I have done two more, I think. Oh, okay. excuse me. <laughs> well, like, we are the experts over on the you, right. You, the the experts are on the right. Okay, so if you've got a really technical question about Blab, by all means, ask those two. Yeah, feel uh, free to look somewhere else. They're experts, absolutely right. <laughs> Okay, so listen, I want to introduce everybody. Um, I know that you've seen these guys, uh, you, you know, you've met these guys on the, uh, the, the the interviews, but I want to introduce them um, or let them introduce themselves. So um, why don't we go with Ian first? Ian, we just want to tell people that don't know who you are, maybe have not caught your episode yet, um, tell them who you are. Okay, so I'm Ian Brody. Um, I, I think I've, it's fair to say I have two fields of expertise. Uh, one is I do um, particularly online marketing and sales for consultants and coaches. So not recruiters, although um, I have a bunch of recruiters do kind of hang around. And uh, actually quite a few consultants to recruiters follow my stuff. Um, that may be why you follow me, Roy. Um, and the other thing I'm relatively well known for is email marketing. So I wrote the book Email Persuasion, which I think for about the last two years has been the number one best-selling book on email marketing on Amazon. So uh, so some people know me for that and some people know me for the consulting coachy type thing. But happy to talk to any of those groups. Brilliant. Brilliant, Ian. Thank you. And for, for anyone who doesn't know, in, when I interviewed Ian, I, I I told him, I'm not sure if he knew this, but I told him, and I'll tell you guys, I, I have been, in fact, all of the experts are people that I regard as mentors. And Ian's book, Email Persuasion, really helped me over a hurdle that I had in my own business. So, uh, you know, genuine mentor. So because you piled a few of them up. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely brilliant. I was able to hop over that hurdle. Yeah. <laughs> it's a great book. All right. It's a really, really good book. Terry, I was just about to introduce you, but Terry's gone. Oh, Terry's back in the room. <laughs> Terry's back in the room. Terry, do you want to um, just introduce, you know, everyone on this is going to know who Terry Edwards is. Every recruiter in the country, every recruiter across the globe is going to know who Terry Edwards is. But Terry, do you want to do you want to just introduce yourself to some of the people that may not know you? Yeah, sure. And hi, Ian. I, I know Ian that you know. Uh, you know my son Drew. Drew. Yeah, I do indeed. That's, you do indeed. Yeah, something from a couple of years ago. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So Terry Edwards. So uh, uh, Drew Coaching. We work with the owners and directors of independently owned um, uh, recruitment and search firms, and our, our sole aim is to help them generate more leads. Uh, I've written uh, three books, and that's what I was going there to get. So I've uh, written a book on LinkedIn, How to Generate Leads lead in LinkedIn. My first book was Seven Deadly Threats to Your Recruitment Search Business. Uh, my last one's Persuasion and Influence. So I'm going to give some of these away at the very end. So you hang around, because I'm going to give some of these books away at the very end. So, yeah, we really show recruiters how to generate leads without making cold calls. In fact, we say do not, under any circumstances, cold call. Um, there are other ways to get your clients to, to buy from you, but never, ever cold call. And I'll share some of that stuff with you a bit later on. 
Cheers, Roy. Brilliant, Terry. Thank you. And, and thanks for the kind offer on the books as well. Um, and our final guest in the room, and actually, I, I only asked David really, really last minute. So I'm so, so pleased that he was able to join us. Um, David Frosdick was originally kind of posted, and David may well turn up. He's got little ones to put to bed. But David Walsh, Walsh grace, gracefully uh, and gratefully um, uh, stepped up to, uh, you know, up to the mark. So, David, for, for people that haven't seen your interview or don't know about you, I know you've got fans on here, but for the people that don't know you, tell us a bit about yourself and what you do. Uh, well, <clears throat> my name is David Walsh, uh, founder of David Walsh Online, which is uh, basically a video uh, uh, promotions company or video marketing company. Uh, David Walsh Online on YouTube, on Periscope, all those typical video places. And basically what I do is help authors, coaches, uh, consultants, business owners, recruitment companies, whoever, to use the power of video to basically connect with their audience and get more of more leads and generate more business, basically, using the power of video. Brilliant, David. Thank you. I don't have a book. <laughs> don't worry, David. I'll give you, yes. a, I'll give yes. you a book. I'll give you a book. Yes. yes, exactly. And and for people that don't know, he won't say this, all right? He, David won't say this because um, uh, uh, he's too humble to. But David, let me ask you the question. How many subscribers do you have on YouTube to your channel? I am just shy of 100,000. No one likes to show off, David. I'm um, I'm really pleased. I'm really pleased that you've joined us. I know Ian's going to tr Ian's going to trump you, and and Terry's no, going to trump you. Um, but the other thing I should let people know again, David Walsh is one of my mentors. Um, uh, if, for people that that don't know David stuff, just find him on YouTube. He's got instruction videos. Uh, free videos. There's loads of free content there. Of course, we want you to buy something, but there's loads of free information there. And, and um, you know, David's stuff really talks to the power of video. The other thing is one of my sons is a massive fan of David Walsh because, again, what he hasn't told you is that he's an international um, taekwondo champion. This is a guy that's competed all over the world. So, Ian, if you've got any credit control to do... He's your man. It's like let's send him out, Terry. He's your man. If you, if anyone owes you any money, let's send David Walsh round. Awesome. I'm gonna remember that, uh, David. <laughs> I'll send a threatening video. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now listen, I I want to kick this off. Okay, we've each got, um, or each of you guys have, have got your expert areas and uh, and the, and the things that you spoke about uh, on the recruitment um, marketing machine summit. But I'd like to kick off with um, a question uh, for all of you. Let me just, uh, I did write this question down. I prepared, wasn't that a good thing? Um, I'm going to kick off by asking Ian and Terry to talk about, is email marketing more powerful than social media for business to business stroke recruitment businesses? You start, Ian. Well, I'm going to say... I want to say I don't like the question. Um, <laughs> the My question of the, the framing is, is it's essentially, you could argue the statistics. So yeah. there was a recent study done um, by Costora study. I think it was 16 million people using it, blah, 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 blah. An email was, tw you know, tw uh, I think it was 40 times as many purchases came from links in email as they did on social media. Yeah. Great. But what does that mean? What does that really mean? Because the truth is, like, kind of asking, you know, is email better than social? It's, it's like kind of saying, well, when it comes to water, is the hydrogen more important than the oxygen? It, it, you need the both. You need the right. both together to get water. You know, it's like it, when it comes to your life, you know, is, is eating, drinking or breathing better? Well, you want to be doing all of them. I'm a fan of all three. Yeah, I'm a fan of all three personally. So um, I found that they go well together. So, you know, email for me is the best follow up mechanism. Right. So but, you know, email is not great for finding people from absolute scratch because you need people to sign up for the email. So social can be a great way of getting people to find you in the first place, making initial connections. And then I would rather have them sign up for emails so I can communicate with them very personally in their inbox on an ongoing basis. And of course, um, email has the advantage of being a bit more automated. I can reach a lot of people as opposed to having to type and interact um, on yeah, social yeah. much on a, a much more kind of manual and labor intensive method. So email has its advantages and psychologically it works a little bit differently as well. You know, if you think about people's lives, 
Um, you know, people working in offices, for example, e email is where they spend a lot of their intense work time where they're concentrating. They get emails from colleagues, from clients, from bosses. When they get an email, they kind of expect to do something with it. So you're in there amongst those, or maybe it's an email from their mom or their wife or something. But you're kind of expecting to do something with it. Mm -hmm. If you're on Facebook, it's a bit more casual and browsy and leisure-like, etc. Now, not that there's anything wrong with that, but it's important to understand the difference in tone um, and take advantage of the difference in tone. You can maybe catch people when they're not. Uh, you know, maybe a good thing to catch people when they're not in work mode on Facebook, but it's also a good people to catch people in work mode when they are um, in their email inbox. So I like to just think of the two working in harmony. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, no, I, I, I like yeah. that. Terry, yeah. Terry, what would you what would you say in terms of um, you know, I, I agree with Ian. I do agree with Ian, but I've also read recently and, you know, like st statistics, damn statistics and all of that kind of stuff. But I, I've read that people that use email as their, uh, you know, as their main form of com uh, of communication um, tend to get more buyers through that channel. The argument is that social media doesn't encourage buyers, but uh, and I, I know David Walsh is going to come in on that in a minute, um, but but um, that, that social media doesn't encourage buyers, whereas the email does. Do you agree or disagree? Well, I suppose, look, here's, here's the thing. For those that don't know me, I email every day of the week, seven days a week. Some days I email two or three times uh, in one day. Right. Now, when we talk to our clients, we encourage them to do this. Here's a, here's a fact. We've never, ever worked with a client who have increased their emails, who happen to also increase their sales as well. Is that, that's a fact. Mm. But what I'd say as well is that email, like anything, don't rely on just email. So we would encourage our, our clients to send emails, to send direct mail. Because here's the advantage of email. It's quick. It's easy. Fantastic. The downside is opening rates. Opening rates on emails are about 30%. Mm. Now, the opening rates on the letter is about 95%. So we would encourage our clients to do both, quite frankly. So I'd say one, one rather than the other. Now, and what I'd also say, any email or any any message, if it's boring, if it's corporate BS, as we call it, it's gonna it's gonna bomb anyway. You know, um, what, I, what I'm gonna do, I've got a, I've got an example. Somebody sent this email out. Um, da, 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 da. Somebody sent this email out on Monday. I'm just gonna read this email out to you. It's not mine, is it? <laughs> no, <laughs> this, no, this, this is a good email. This uh, this resulted oh. in um, eight clients getting back to them saying, "I want to talk to you." So very quickly, the story is a highly successful. Uh, software executive dies and goes to hell. You may have heard the story before. She finds herself on a beautiful golf course in the distance on an exclusive country club. Many of her old friends were there, smartly dressed and having a wonderful time. She runs towards them and they all cheer and welcome her with open arms. They sit down and have a fabulous meal of steak, lobster, uh, champagne. Uh, there was also a vegetarian option as well. The devil joins them telling jokes and quite honestly being very good company. Welcome to hell, he says. Just to let you know, you have a choice between here and heaven. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to take you to heaven and then you can decide where you say. She says, sure, that seems fair enough. The next day, she takes the elevator up to heaven. She spends the whole day in the clouds playing the harp and overall having an OK time. St. Peter approaches and says, what's your choice? Is it heaven or is it hell? She replies without much hesitation. Well, hell doesn't seem that bad after all. So I'm going to go for hell. The next day, she goes down in the lift back to hell. When the door opens, her friends are there again, but now they're looking really miserable and they're sitting on a filthy wasteland going through garbage for food. The software executive says, I don't understand. Yesterday it was steak, lobster, champagne, a beautiful country club, and everyone was happy. What's happened? The devil replies, yesterday we were recruiting you, now your staff. <laughs> I think so many executives share the same challenges when being headhunted by the competitors. However, when they join the company, it's nothing like the brochure the consequence of which the executive feels let down and underperforms. Now, there's some things that you need to do to ensure that you attract the right candidates. Go here and get this free book, um, How to Attract a Successful um, Executive. That's the power of an email. Um, she sent that to, I think it was something, only 182 people, eight people requested that ebook. Now, she's just generated eight leads just like that from sending an email. Mm -hmm. Why wouldn't you send an email? Terry, tell me that was one of your students. Yeah. Boom. Drop the mic. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> I love that. I really, really, that's the power, isn't it? It's storytelling. Yeah. And, um, you know, David, for you, I know you harness all of them. And I, I kind of threw, as yeah. Ian noted, I threw that in as a kind of a contentious question to, 
to pit social media versus email. Ian wasn't falling for it. Terry wasn't falling for it. <laughs> but would you would you argue the power of video over email? Um, you know, video, YouTube, social media channel over the power of email? No, uh, I'd agree with the two guys in that um, you have to have one with the other. Yeah. Like your your social media, including fa um, YouTube, is is an avenue to get somebody in. Yeah. Uh, whether that is free organic content or whether it's a paid ad, uh, either on YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, wherever, they're just a to get people into your funnel, you get their email address and you follow up. Now, people who say that social media isn't good for the follow up are obviously doing social media wrong because yeah. they're obviously not doing retargeting or remarketing or anything like that. Uh, and that's the power of social media when it comes to a marketing thing uh, uh, for, for a follow up that they have to have your retargeting pixels on your pages, all of that good stuff, so that David, you can David, hit them that there. seven or ten times to get them on to, to buy your product or whatever. David, for those that don't know, would you just explain what retargeted in? Because a lot of guys yeah. were okay. familiar with so that. So easiest, easiest, easiest example is you go to Amazon, you look at a widget, and then all of a sudden every single website you go to has an advertisement for that particular widget. You're going, how the hell did that happen? Basically, what it's they put a, a pixel on your web browser that said you looked at this particular widget. We're going to advertise that widget to you for X amount of days. That's that's retargeting or remarketing, depending on uh, which platform you're working with. So you, you'll see it. You, you know, you go to Facebook after you've been to Amazon, and then all of a sudden, that those pair of shoes you were looking at, hey, you can get these here. Blah blah blah, that sort of thing. So. That's the power of the follow-up. And, and the reason they do it is, A, their advertising cost is dramatically lower than uh, the front-end advertising, and B, it works, simple as. So if, if people are saying that social media isn't working for the follow-up, they are doing it so wrong. Absolutely. I, again, I, I do endorse that, David, e everything. And, and, and one of the powers of remarketing, and now we're kind of going away here, Roy, but just, you know, we've got clients, recruiters that are using remarketing, and what it means is that when they reach out to potential clients, you know, to see what their needs are, yeah. the clients go, yeah, I, I know who you guys are. I see you guys everywhere. It's ever so powerful. It's a really powerful yeah, tool. The, the weird thing about that is they think, I see you everywhere. They assume you must be advertising everywhere. You, yeah. Your ad's only shown three times to four people. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> it feels like you're everywhere because they are the right target audience for you. Yeah. Yeah. And and I love that. I really do. Because for the first time, and, and, and I think I'm older than all of you, so I, I can pull this one. Uh, maybe not Terry. Um, <laughs> no need for that. <laughs> um, I, I remember, you know, in the good old bad old days of, of starting recruiting, where the companies with the biggest pockets were able to buy advertising so you know those huge recruitment companies they take the billboards they would do radio advertising they do tv advertising and they would absolutely wipe the floor with small independent recruitment businesses like like mine um the beauty about some of those tools that you talked about, definitely the social media, definitely the email. But as David said there, the retargeting, it, it's a game changer, a leveler uh, of the market like we've never, ever seen before. So, you know, all, all, all hail retargeting, whoever came up with that concept first. Does anyone know? Was it was it Facebook? Was it Google? Who, who did it first? Um, Google and others were at it long before yeah. Facebook, yeah. Right. Fantastic. Well, bless them. Uh, you know, the gods at Google. <laughs> I don't thank them for much, but I, I thank them for retargeting. <laughs> Hallelujah. OK, um, look, are, are there any questions? D, I'm just trying to think any pressing questions. That it, these... well, Tim's just asked uh, about um, doing retargeting in practice. And, ba and basically retargeting is not is not all that complex. So if you use fa it depends on your platform. So Facebook's a good example to use. So on Facebook, if you're running Facebook ads, um, all you do is you go into Facebook and they have a pixel section and you can go and you get that pixel. It's just a little script. You put it on your website. You put it on all your pages these days. Um, and then later on, you can come back and you just create specific audiences in Facebook. And you can say, for example, a simple one might be show this advert to everyone who's visited my blog in the last 30 days. Mm. You can get much smarter, though, and you can say, for example, um, let's say someone went to your download, you know, they signed up, they got your emails, they went to the download page, but they, they didn't then take your next offer. You can target them specifically. So you can ex you can say only the people who vis visited this page, but but exclude the people who visited this page when they've gone further. So it's uh, 
you can do some quite nice, nice stuff all about which pages they've visited and which pages they haven't. They're introducing more things as well, like events and uh, yeah, it, it will be very soon where they, you'll be able to retarget people based on how long they've been on your page. You can already target based on how many pages they've visited now. So Facebook are innovating the, the marketing platform all the time. Yeah, yeah. absolutely yeah. absolutely brilliant. And it is because that. David, you, can, uh, you can retarget. I guess you call it retargeting when people have watched a video. So you can. Yep. So people have watched it, the video it, for the it's, five seconds. It's the exact then, same, then, exact same on AdSense or AdWords, mm. that whether you go to the search engine or whatever or YouTube, that again, you just pop, pop in your code and then somebody who's watched the video, somebody has gone to your page. So you can also put your pixel for your Facebook pixel on there. You can put your AdWords pixel on there. So you can go, hey, so you can do a video follow up on Facebook and you also can do another video follow up on YouTube as well. And the other thing is just get your just get your pixels on right now. Um, yeah, you don't exactly. have to build, you don't have do anything. Just get them on, and then by the time you've figured out how to run an ad, then you'll uh, th then you'll have the build up audience of people who visited the pages um, already set up, and there's no there's kind of no effort. Yeah, and just exactly. just on that from a technical aspect, just get your web guy to do it uh, for your yeah. web guy. It's like a, it's like a two minute job. So or your sixteen year old son. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, but don't really don't get too too too, um, too bogged down in it um, in in terms of the, the technical aspect. Just you know, if you don't have to do it, just get somebody to do it. Just outsource it, it's, but get it done. And just you know what, Terry makes an important point about not getting getting bogged down because there there will be a tendency as we have this discussion because we do this kind of for a living yeah. is we will get really excited about the more advanced versions of retargeting. Oh yes, I retargeted based on you know they blinked when they watched my advert, and you might be watching going, wow, that's that? really complicated. <laughs> Just get the basics first, because if you get the basics, you'll be way ahead of most people. You'll be way yeah. ahead of most people. Yeah. And guys, just, you know, look, from from a, a complete layperson's point of view, um, you know, Terry's absolutely right. If, if you don't know what to do, get somebody in. Um, and Ian's saying it's like, don't overcomplicate it. The, the thing that really got me about um, retargeting was again, and I'm going to, you know, g give this old world, new world kind of slant on it. In the old world, we would have advertised in the yellow pages. Every recruitment business in the world would have been a listing in the yellow pages. And if you were aardvark recruitment, you did very, very well because that was the top bloody one in recruitment agencies and you'd get the first calls. Um, but imagine that, okay? It, you know, it sits in this uh, before the net. It sits in this great big yellow volume that sits on your thing and only if people are looking would they go to the listing and then they're going to go to the a's the b's the c's uh, well if you've got a name like roy ripper you know that's going to come right down at the bloody end uh, the only thing worse would have been i don't know zodiac recruitment and apologies to any of the zodiac recruitments out there um think about it retargeting is really just putting your advert this is a lay layman's kind of explanation for it putting your advert in front of people that have already expressed an interest or, or happen to be on your website or consume some content. So it's like putting a newspaper advert in front of everybody that's that said, I like what David Walsh does. David's able to put an advert in front of anybody that's had any interaction with him at all. Same for Ian, same for, uh, for Terry and for, for any of us, and same for any of you watching this. If you've got a recruitment business, um, if, you, if you haven't embraced retargeting, as Ian said, do it tomorrow because you will be 90% ahead of uh, where most people are. So th thanks, guys, for sharing that. Just a final word on retargeting. Please, yeah. One of the things that I think is nice about retargeting is I think one thing that holds a lot of people back from their marketing is they do not want to be to come across as being too aggressive or too <laughs> pushy in their marketing. You hear that all from a lot of people in, in every field. I hear it in my field. I know you guys hear it in yours as well. Um, and retargeting allows you to be effective without seeming quite so pushy. So normally, yeah. you know, a few years ago, if you're doing Facebook ads, you would send people from a Facebook ad straight into a squeeze page, a sign up page to get them to sign up for stuff. Now, I still do that most of the time. My audience is very happy with that. I don't get people go, oh, no, you send me to sign up. You know, if it's good, they'll sign up. Yeah. But what you can do if you want with retargeting is instead of sending them to something where they have to sign up straight away and make a commitment immediately, you can do an advert to send them to a blog post with loads of useful content on they can just read. And yeah. then if they've read that useful blog, um, blog post, then you can retarget the ones who are actually interested 
and then send the squeeze page advert to those. So you, you can you can be a little bit more gentle if you want. Now, you have to make your decision, and actually you'd have to test it and see which one's the most effective. Are you better off going straight to the squeeze page, or are you better off going to the blog post first and then retargeting? But it does give you options if you want to take a gentler approach to things. Ian, is it, and for any of you to answer this, Terry, you might, you might know um, sort of more than I on this. I, I've heard somewhere from one of my mentors that – it's actually cheaper to do what Ian's just described, the, the, the cost of advertising, taking cold traffic to content, i.e. a blog post, a video or whatever, where you're delivering value is cheaper than taking them perhaps to a squeeze page or to, you know, a, a, an offer. Is that true? Have I just made that up? Well, a couple of things on there. I, I think it depends on how you're measuring it. So what we measure is the acquisition of the lead. Right. So. And so, so, so uh, sorry, guys, I'm not sure, but we are passionate direct response marketing. So any marketing that we do, we want to get a response. If we don't get a response, something's gone wrong and we're going to work at getting the response. So we wouldn't send anybody to a blog and there was somewhere that we can get a response from the, from the person there. That we, but we want to know their interest and we're going to ask for, the, ask for their details. So it really depends what you measure in. I think the other point you made earlier, Roy, about you know the cost of it and you brought up about newspapers. The other thing, I don't want to go on, this isn't about direct marketing per se, this, this, this meeting, but the other thing about this marketing, a lot of marketing now, is that imagine that your local newspaper rings you up and says, look, you can place an ad with us. And you say, well, I'm not sure. And they say this, place the ad with us, but you're only going to pay if you get a response. Now, you're going to say, well, where do I sign? Now, that's the beauty of remarketing and a lot of stuff that we talk about. You only pay... If you if you get a lead, so you know going back to some of the stuff that David's doing, and some of the videos you see on YouTube where you click on the video and then that 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 ad comes on. Yeah, David, you're correct on that. I think it's three seconds. They display the ad the the ad for three seconds. If you do it off, they don't pay for it. Now yep. just think about the power of that. <laughs> you're only going to get you're only going to pay for the leads that you get if somebody clicks on your ad, and that is so powerful. And the beauty, somebody's asked in here. I think it was uh, David at. Um, uh, so say, so, you know, how many guys are doing this? Honestly, most recruiters have no idea. Absolutely most no people idea. In most businesses aren't, aren't doing it. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The very fact that you're here listening to this, you've got a massive yeah. advantage. Yeah. A massive because the fact that you're just here listening, you know, you're picking all this stuff up. Most of your competitors have no idea. But what I would say on this, and I can't repeat myself on this, it's not the knowing, it's the implementation. You know, it. It, you, you've got to go and do it. So yeah. it's right up yeah. to you. Hey, Roy, just going back to that cost thing, it, it comes back to you've got to test. You really do have to test. Exactly. Um, and you, what you're doing in that case is you're, it is, I mean, I prefer simple. So my preferred method is straight with squeeze page because it's simpler and I'm, yeah. I'm not very complicated. But what you can do, and the, the people you're hearing, you're, the, the ones you're, you're hearing saying it's cheaper to go to a blog and then retarget, what they're doing is they're measuring the, the – they're essentially finding out that the click cost to a blog post, in theory – is cheaper than the click cost to a squeeze page. Right. We have that cost. And then, you, of course, on a blog post, you're going to have like a content upgrade. You're going to have the, you know, you're going to have a, uh, you can't on Facebook send them to a blog post with a with a pop-up, but you right. can send them with an exit intent pop. You can have a sidebar opt-in. So you'll get a certain percent will opt-in on the blog post if you do the blog post right. Yeah. So it's certain types of blog post. It's not a blog post that you just want them to read and then go away. It's right. a blog post that leads them to opting in. And then the ones who, who don't opt in, you then retarget them because you pixeled them straight to a squeeze page. And then you add up the combined cost and the number who opted in. And you're going to find that either straight to a squeeze page is going to be cheaper or sending them down the blog post and retargeting route is going to be cheaper. The guys you're speaking to are saying it's cheaper if you do the more complex route. I've not yeah. found that to be the case in my market. Okay. I think it's very market dependent. I think in... I think one of the challenges we often face is that the leading edge guys who are giving all this, you know, this is the way to do things. They tend to work in things like the internet marketing sector. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. their market is different. Their yeah. market is highly jaded, highly suspicious, just interested in making money. And they don't necessarily react the same way as our market, as our yeah. markets do. So um, test yeah. for your own market and make sure, yes, take ideas, from the, the internet marketers who tend to be ahead of the game, but make sure you're testing in your market because your customers are different and yeah. you need to, you need to operate how, how your customers will react. Yeah. You made a really good point there. And everything, I think everything that's shared, uh, you're, you're hearing tonight and whenever you hear it, 
Don't take our opinion. Go away and test it. You know, our opinion exactly. doesn't count for anything. Go and test it for yourself because, you know, we'll tell you something or your mates down the pub and say, oh, that won't work. Mm. Well, that, that opinion doesn't matter. Go and test it for yourself and, and see for yourself. So whatever you do with all this stuff, just go and test it. Great, That's great, exactly. great advice. D David Walsh, in yeah. terms of the retargeting, um, the application of that with video specifically yes. and YouTube's like your your biggest channel, any any specific tips with regards to retargeting for recruitment businesses that are, are considering video? I mean, you know, yeah, people know I'm a big fan of video and I love it, etc. Um, for recruitment businesses that are thinking about using YouTube as a channel and the retargeting piece, how, any tips for us there? Absolutely. Like going back to say we're sending people to say a blog post with an opt in, but they haven't opted in or they have opted in, but they haven't taken you up on your offer. Right. You can custom you can basically uh, customize your what I would recommend is customize your video to as, as specific to that piece of content as possible. Okay. So if they went to a specific blog post about how to say for recruitment, the top five things you need to have on your CV to get a job, whatever, right. da, 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 whatever it is, um, or it is uh, how to get how to get better executives. There you go. So okay. um, so then you can have your video specific calling to them it says, hey, we noticed you were looking at our, our uh, the article about how to get better executives. Here's another four ways you can do it. And we have it in the quick report. Just click over here and you'll download the free report. It's only two pages. It'll take you 60 seconds to read. Click here now, go over and get the report and get more executives in your recruitment company. Boom, simple as. And so I've, you can target specifically what they've been looking at. I, I've seen those adverts that David runs, and I'm the one that's always clicking. It's like, it, 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 it's so powerful. It you really David powerful. Money then. Say again. You owe David money now. You've been checking. You've been checking <laughs> his advertising costs. I definitely, I definitely owe him money. And if you see his black belts in, it, you know, it's like you won't want to owe him any money. I promise <laughs> you. Um, but the, the the point there is that you know David was saying it's so compelling because the video is congruent with the content or with the offer that exactly. you've originally made. And I, again, the retargeting. Um, uh, that 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 Ian and Terry talked about. It works in exactly the same way. It it almost feels like well, these people are following me around the internet, and they yeah. know exactly where my head's at with this. They know my pain point. If that's the you know the thing that we've gone after, they know the things I'm interested in. They know the things that are keeping me up at night, and 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 the the, the secondary offer or the retargeting just it, it, it speaks to that particular point and yeah, it's you're really so smart about it as well because if you if you've got an advert that sends someone to a squeeze page you know what they were interested in because they clicked on that advert yeah. but if you don't opt in on your squeeze page then you firstly there's a bit of learning there there's a disconnect between what yeah. you know what you're sending them to but then you think well okay they were interested in this but they didn't want this yeah. so what else might they be interested in and retarget them and send them to a slightly different opt-in offer that you know the same sort of people are going to get. So you you know don't just keep sending them to the same thing. If they say no once, they're probably going to say no again, yeah. um, unless they just missed it the first time. Yeah. Um, so you can be smart about it. And again, test. Um, I've had times where I've tested retargeting people going to the same offer again, and I've got more people. Great. Yeah. I've had times where I've tested people going to the same offer again, and I've got less people because obviously they they just don't want it, and that's why they said no the first time. Mm. Uh, another another thing you can do as well is if you're sending them to a squeeze page and they're not opting in, maybe they just need some content for them to make that uh, educated decision to go, ah, oh, that is, is what I'm looking for. So there's your video. You can give them five tips in a video and say, hey, if you'd like more, I've got a free report, blah, 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 and then send them back to your yeah, exact same idea. squeeze page. That's right. And uh, just to add to what David said there, what we find with videos, it, it just helps with the relationship. Exactly. Uh, you know, the, the letters exactly. and the emails, is, there's no relationship. And then you show a video, and we found that that's really improved our opt-in. So that's a really good point there, David. And another reason you should be using videos as well, quite frankly, because um, it's, it's dead easy to do as well. And, exactly. and you get and you get good looking guys like this. <laughs> well, <laughs> we can do video, anyone can do video. <laughs> David, David, listen, you, you, you touch there on con you touch there on content. One of the questions that um, I get asked a lot, and uh, and I know there'll be people in this room that are, are thinking the same thing. It's like, oh my god, you know, how do I keep coming up with content? Um, now, I know you're across many mediums. It's like you're known for video, but of course you do your email and, and, and everything else. But yeah. on the video specifically, yeah. what, how do you keep coming up with stuff? 
Uh, it, it, to be honest with you, it actually isn't that difficult because if you've been in business for any length of time, you've been asked the same 50 questions year in, year out. Yeah. So each one of those questions is one single video. So there's yeah. 50. There's 50 videos, and if you're doing one video a week, that's 12 months worth of content. So there's 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 a year's worth right there. Um, if you're talking to somebody new and they've got a, a, something a, new technologies come out or new 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 legislations come out, there's a whole another slew of content to deal with right there. You can make five to ten videos out of that alone. Mm -hmm. So all you have to really do is just look around you, look at the obvious to something. To you, it might not be important or think that no one wants to know about this, but I guarantee you there is. And yeah. it's that one thing that you take for granted that you think the whole industry takes for granted that everyone is looking for. And that's when people go, oh, my God, that was a question I was looking for forever. And no one was able to answer it. But I saw your video and that was exactly what I wanted. Where do I sign up? Amazing. Really, really good. Yeah, Terry, just... Terry. Yeah, I was going to say, Terry, for you, you're you know, you mentioned earlier on, you send emails out every single day and there'll be people out there going, oh my God, how does Terry come up with, you know, he, all this stuff, man? Your brain must be constantly going all the time. Yeah, and, and in fairness, I, I am constantly looking out for material and I'll, right. I'll share personal experiences. Uh, we'll share, you know, I wrote one the other day and it's, uh, the headline was, I hate politicians. Well, who doesn't hate politicians? Right and now. I can crack a joke about, you know, you can always tell when the politicians lie because they open their mouths. And I just wanted to <laughs> say that I was just sick and tired of all the politics and whatever. And the point I'm making, and, and so we, we work on the, you tell a story and then the point is, and I said, and the yeah. point is your clients are sick and tired of getting cold calls from recruiters. You know, tell them how fast they are. And I literally just do that. So we literally just find something that's going on in our lives. And we encourage our clients to do it as well. So one of our clients today went to a restaurant. Um, I think the table's booked for 8.30. He's there with his family. They don't get to sit down until 9.30. He's got two young kids as well. And the meal was okay, but he was kind of pissed off with the whole, whole thing at, at the end of it. And he came home and he wrote an email about it. And he said, you know, went to a restaurant. The food was great and everything, but I was kept waiting for an hour before I got to the table. He said, the point is, do you know, some candidates we send for interviews, they kept waiting in the reception for an hour and a half. And then, they, then the client wonders why, they, why the candidate doesn't want to join them. Now, there's a lesson there, isn't there? And it's just using that kind of, that yeah. kind of a example where you just tell a story and say, the point of it is this, and here's a lesson from it. And it really is as simple as that. There's a lot of um, scientific evidence to support that we engage with the story. So yeah. if you want to, here's a tip, by the way, if you really want to persuade your clients or your candidates tell them a story because it bypasses their, their conscious mind and you can get your point over much better with a story and you can do that in emails and it's re relatively easy to do as well yeah. so and you know tell a story and get a sale tell a joke and you're going to get a sale <laughs> it's all about observation <laughs> isn't it i mean what terry was talking about there um i very early on in my kind of writing career as if i'm a writer but I, I have a friend who used to be a stand-up comic, and he was saying that the difference between st successful stand-up comedians and the rest of us is stand-up comic will be standing at the bus stop alongside us, and so and someone will you know run, walk into a lamppost and fall over, and we'll all we'll all laugh, but the stand-up comic will notice that and think, how can I turn that into a joke? How can I work right. that into something? Exactly. Keep a notebook with you all the time, right. or your phone, or whatever, and write this stuff down because your brain can't remember it. Keep it by the side of the bed at night, exactly, because you will <laughs> think of something in the middle of the night and you will forget it if you go back to sleep. So keep writing this stuff down. And by the end, you know, by the end of any given time, you've got a ton of material you can use. And go small as well. I think that's another thing. If you notice, both the examples we've heard are quite detailed things. Yeah. If you sit down and try and write an article about how to be a brilliant recruiter, you will be there forever and you'll never come up with anything. It's too big a topic. But yeah. if you go deep and say how to stop annoying people by keeping them waiting too long, the, you know, the yeah. really deep, narrow topic, you can A, there's many, many more of those, and B, they're more interesting because there's meat in them, there's substance. Yeah. You, can tell a, yeah. you can't tell a story about how to be a brilliant recruiter. You can tell a story about the time you were kept waiting for an hour and a half in reception because it's a real life thing. That's right. And then also the other where we get material from, we get emails from clients. So mm. I, I probably I have a file and it's just emails from clients where they share stuff from us. Some of it you kind of beggars belief and some of it you just think it's quite inspirational. And we will literally keep those copy paste and we, we call it top and tail. So we start it we then And, you know, sometimes we reveal the identity. Another time, um, you know, we, we tell about warts and all. Uh, but, you know, 
clients complain about you. You've got clients that you know <laughs> haven't paid their bill for 90 days and then complain about the service that you're providing. I'd share that in an email. I mean, <laughs> clients complain that they want a good, they want the cheapest recruiter, uh, but they want the best candidates. You can't have both. Share it in a story, but share mm. some of your experiences and just just keep hold of it every single time. And you know what? If you don't have any experiences, make them. Now, of course, you do have experiences. Everybody has experiences. But I, I love um, Dave Gorman. You know the comedian Dave yes. Gorman? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. One of the things he does is in order to create an act, he goes out and does interesting things. He doesn't sit in a room thinking, is there something interesting I can write about? He goes out and messes about, you know, so he goes and finds everyone else called Dave Gorman. He lives his <laughs> life by the throw of a dice. He just goes out and does stupid things and records what happens and then that's his act for him. And of course, we're not going to do necessarily stupid things. But if you're a recruiter and you're trying to tell people, you know, the best way to do X is, is this, go out and do it. You know, yeah. just experiment with it. Go out, try it and tell people what you're doing. I think sometimes we feel as if we have to be the kind of big expert on high who's been doing what we do for 100 years. But I think these days people connect more with people who are just one or two steps ahead of them. Yeah. Who are human like they are. And who yeah. will share their experiences there uh and and that works really well so just try stuff out and, and then yeah that's a really good point there ian and, and, and again uh, showing your vulnerability uh, nobody likes a, a big no no yeah. at all we had a client who um um it was anniversary of the death of his wife his wife died, died of uh, breast cancer and he just he just shared it with his list of, of two thousand uh, uh clients so this he said today uh, a year ago, my wife passed, passed away with breast cancer. And he said, I, I hate this day. And he really kind of put his heart on, on, on in, in the email. Now, yeah. he wasn't doing it um, to, uh, to get sales. But what he found was that he got people coming back saying, oh, I'm really sorry. And he started some great relationships with it because it's just it, we're all vulnerable. And most people don't want to show that vulnerability. But mm -hmm. do you know what? It actually helps saying, do you know what? Sometimes you get it wrong. If you drop a clanger, and boy, if Drew and I dropped some clients yeah. along the way, and I'm sure you guys, you know, but you know, we've all done some really stupid things. Share it with your list. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, own up to it. Own yeah. up to it. And because we're all human animals, and like we're talking about story here, which is a human thing. We're, we grew up on stories. Yeah. We grew up on TV that was all about stories. We grew, we, you know, we talk, we connect with other people. We fuck up, they fuck up. We connect with people who fuck up, basically. Excuse That's my French, right. but you know, it's like it, you you have to be authentic and real. Yeah. And when you fuck up, you know, raise your hands and go, you know what? That was me. I fucked up, but here's the five lessons I learned, and I'm going to share them with you, and I guarantee you that will never happen again. And I'm yeah. doing this so it helped you that it won't happen to you either. Yeah. So, you know, those are always the highest open rates of emails, aren't they? Exactly. You know, my something mistake, my worst yeah. something ever, yeah. always the highest open rate because people want to know. Mm. On the other hand, so many people want to send you emails about their brilliant successes. Here, yeah. how I made a million dollars do it. I don't care. <laughs> Tell me about how you messed up. And I mean, yeah, I'm sure you <laughs> lost two million and you came back and made five. Then that's a different story. It's really funny because I'm, I'm thinking here. It's like everyone knows. I've, I've you know I've put out thousands of videos and what have you. But the most popular webinar that I've ever done, hands down, was the biggest recruiting mistakes that I've ever made. I.e., the people that I've taken on that were an absolute nightmare. And there were seven seven that I would admit to. Um, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> universally, I've got nearly four. Where are the other 50? Almost as there many seven hands people hands. on that call <laughs> because they wanted to know if it was them. <laughs> <laughs> Boom. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it's Terry makes a brilliant point, though, about personality and, and, and David about authenticity. Look, we're in a different world. You know, the, 50 years ago, yeah. you know, celebrities were the Beatles landing in an airplane and people would scream at them yeah. from, you know, from the from the gates or whatever, 100 years. That's as close as you got to celebs. These yeah. days, people are in, talking to their, their celebrities on Twitter all the time. There's a degree of openness which is now expected and insight into your life. You can argue whether it's good or bad. But it's there. You know, yeah. people today expect something different. They expect a relationship with other people that, you know, with, with the people they buy things from, essentially. They and that's right. want you that's at a right. distance. And, and as a recruiter, uh, you know, what we found is the recruiters have the, the narrow your niche, the broader your appeal. So you're almost trying to position yourself as, the, as a celebrity in yeah. your particular niche market. And that's what it's all about because 
that's who you want to engage with. So it's, it's a very small market that you're, that you're engaging and just sharing stuff about yourself. And again, just to repeat, we've never worked with a client who's, who, who's done this and it hasn't worked. It always worked. They always get more business. I mean, I mentioned this in the, in the, in the summit. Your clients will buy from you when they're ready to buy. Yeah. not when you're ready to sell. But just yeah. going back to what you said earlier, Terry, you always link, the, you tell a story, but you link it to something they can learn for their business. It's that link that's crucial. You, yeah. can, you can't just uh, write, write emails that tell stories about you yeah. and your kids, etc. You've got to link it to something. You can get away with that occasionally, but you, yeah. need, you do need to link to something that's useful to them. Yeah. And that, that works really well. Yeah. As David said earlier, it, it, you know, we grew up with stories. I, you know, I'm remembering... Uh, you know, for me, uh, you know, the, 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 the church stories, the Bible stories. And I know as kids, we were we were battered with some of the morals behind them. But um, it, it was brilliant because the story resonated. And I, I could still, you know, I'm sure any of us can, can remember those stories that we were told as children. They resonate with you. But underneath all of them, if, I, if you look at the, the fairy tales, <laughs> I mean, they were scary. Yeah, Absolutely. They were. Scary. Yeah. Fables, yeah. For example, you know, the, oh. that's, that's, those are the things you remember. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like the, those, those four words that every child loves <laughs> once upon a time. They will go, oh, okay, now we're ready for a good time. You know, and, and you're talking about the Bible. It, the Bible is the biggest book of stories ever, and it's still the most – the the, most, the highest selling book of all time yeah. because it's a book of stories. That's yeah. what it is. Yeah, I thought it was one of Terry's books that was the best. Selling. <laughs> I think I, I think you're well, That's right, actually. <laughs> I, think, I think it's this one. Actually. <laughs> um. Oh, guys, this is okay. Look, there's some really great stuff, and we're getting some fantastic comments. And look, just take a moment, experts, just to read through any of those, just to kind of feel a bit their love. For the people that are watching this as well, some brilliant stuff coming through. Do me a favor, just t uh, first of all, give the people a bit of a clap. So for David and Ian and Terry, if anything they've said has really resonated with you, please, please show some appreciation for them. I'm learning here. I'm yeah. really, really it's learning. interesting there about being a celebrity in your market. And you I know, what? I have always been hesitant about the celebrity word because I've always mm. been a content and a, you know, there's got to be real substance. And I, I have this thing that, well, you know, celebrities, too many celebrities today are all, you know, all showing no substance. Yeah. But I think there's a lot of truth to the celebrity thing. And I think certainly going back to what Terry said almost at the start, you know, we're in the entertainment business. The, yep. There is so much choice of, you know, Let's say even 10 years ago, if you were a recruitment expert, if you were an expert recruiter, there weren't that many other expert recruiters that your potential clients could find. It was a handful, the people yeah. they knew personally. Nowadays, they can go on the web and find hundreds upon hundreds upon hundreds. How are you yeah. going to differentiate? Well, one way is you can be more expert. So you've got the niche that Terry talked about, or you can be more expert at a certain thing. But, yeah. you know, increasingly, it gets harder and harder. And often it's your personality. They just click with you. I can't snap my fingers, but some people just click with you and others don't. If you yeah. hide your personality away, if you hide it away, no one's going to click. If you let that's, it come that's to the really front. Good point, yeah. that's, and you brought a really good point there because often recruiters say, well, I don't want to be, <laughs> I don't want to be myself because I might piece some people off. That's okay. So whatever you <laughs> do, the whole don't point. Do things to all that's people. You know, you can't be all things to all people. It's something exactly. called. There's something called the third rule. A third will love you, yep. a third are indifferent, and a third will absolutely hate you. You think yep. of any celebrity. Um, here's, a, here's one of mine. Rihanna. I don't get it. I honestly <laughs> don't get What's it. What's wrong with you? <laughs> I think the music's lousy. I just, I just don't get it. But she's got people that you know, absolutely adore her. And here's the thing about Rihanna. Just, I mean, just very quickly. She's had, I think she's had nine or 11 number ones. Mm. Do you know Bob Marley and the Whalers have never had a number one? No. I mean, just, that's not right is it that's it's not right no <laughs> can't that's argue with that one <laughs> you know and that's there's a, a lot of big bands who've never had a bit number one but people like that but but she kind of she gets it now whatever you think of her she, she in terms she's got people that absolutely love her you yeah. will have people that will absolutely love you if you're yourself but if you try and be something that you're not that's when you're gonna you, you're gonna get those challenges so don't yeah, try I'm, and be all things to all people exactly yeah I've I've got a point on this as well, and and um, just to, to to echo what what we've just said there, and, and Ian, I I'm I'm like you in that sense of um, I never felt really comfortable with the word 
celebrity and I don't like the words guru and all these different things bandied about, particularly about myself, but but e- even the people that I follow, it's like I don't regard them as gurus or celebrities. I, I think there's an even more basic thing that's been missing from uh, just life and business in general, and that's leaders. I think there's a whole host of people out there, um, including us, that we we look for leaders. You know, we look for people that have got a vision or a message. And as Terry said, uh, you know, it, it speaks to me. There'll be some people that I speak to that my message will piss off. Well, you know, that's fine. I'm not a leader for them. There will be a leader for those people, but I'm not that person. Mm. And I think genuinely, um, you know, and even the so-called celebrities, um, people in in you know general public are clamoring to follow somebody with a vision it's like please somebody give me you know an idea a vision something that i can follow and i think i think it's, I think it's a quote by jay abraham who said something like people are silently crying out to be led and but he also he said after that it's not because they're stupid it's yeah. not because they haven't got any thoughts of their own but we can't all be experts in everything exactly. nobody has the time to be an expert at everything so for the topics where we are not the experts in that particular area, we look to someone to show the way and to lead us. So I yeah. think originally when I was kind of, you have to be a leader, I was kind of, you know, oh, yeah, but that's very condescending to people. People, don't, But they do. People, will, you know, if I need to buy a car, I'm not a car expert. I mm, want to yeah. read a magazine or listen to someone who really knows what they're talking about so I get the right information and I make the right decision. I don't want to have to do all the research myself because it's not yeah. my field. And, and that's and that's the beauty. And, and I mean, what Ian just said there, every recruiter, every search firm can, can learn from that because mm. hiring managers and I don't don't think they're the experts. So you having like that free report, like seven questions to ask a search firm before you engage them on your website or send out an email saying I've got a report here. I've got seven questions that you must ask a recruiter before before you engage them. Now, if a client's in the market for, for a recruiter, they're going to get that report because they want that information. And then you know exactly who to talk to. And that's so easy to do just by sending out an email offering a solution to the client's problem. And no, it's offering a solution to the client's problem rather than talking about how great you are. Because I've said it before, but your clients don't really care about you. They simply care about themselves. And that's what you've got to uh, communicate to them, their problem. Exactly. Listen, I want to um, just change the topic slightly and and, uh, move it to a different uh, different point. David, I want you to to try and come in on this. I was just thinking there about the funniest or oddest video that I've ever searched for on YouTube that I would care to admit to publicly. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm, I'm, going. Yeah, no. <laughs> so I'm going to tell you, this This is genuine, right? I was um, in my office, and this was about two or three years ago, and uh, the three of you will be really familiar with this problem. I had one of those portable green screens and um it was one of the ones that kind of folded up yeah, yeah. into like a, a great big circle but then when you opened it it popped and it was like this great big backdrop and I, I got it open not a problem but i i was there and i'm trying to fold this thing up to get it back into the circular shape and i thought this is bullshit why am i doing this i'm like i'm struggling here and unfortunately, I didn't have any of my children to ask, as I think, you know, one of one of you suggested you need a 16 year old son. I didn't have any of them around. So what I did is I, I YouTubed it. How do you fold up a backdrop screen and put it into a thing? And there was a bloody video for it. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> in fact, there wasn't just one. I think there were several, but there was yeah, one that was brilliant. popular and it did the trick. So that was my oddest video search. Um I, I don't know whether Terry or Ian will, will have one that they can think of. And if they can't, don't worry. But David, is is my example, is that very odd? Is there, are there more odd things than Far that? Far from it. Really? Far from it. It's like, it's like how to fold back one of those pop-up tents. It's the exact same principle. You know, it's like people have a problem. It's a problem that a lot of people have. But you just think, oh, no one has a green screen thing like me. So no one's going to have this problem. But... There's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people all over the world with the exact same problem. And that's why you've had all of those videos on there. So as I said earlier, it's like that one thing that you take for granted that you might not think is important to share with your audience, that could be the single thing that brings in most of your business. It goes back to uh, the 80-20 principle. It could be that that 
that one thing that brings in 80% of your business, yeah. you know? So uh, don't underestimate anything. Like you have a problem, there's guaranteed to be other people in the world with that problem. If one client comes to you with a problem, you, again, there's more than likely other people in the shadows or wherever in, in, in the background with that exact, exact same problem. And you, you, what you'll find is that if you're using video to bring in clients or whatever, you'll find that uh, on occasion, somebody will go, you know, when you ask them, how did you find me? Someone will go, you know, that weird video you had on blah, blah, blah. That was what brought me in. And you go, holy crap. You know, and again, that's something you would have, you would have taken for granted. So yeah. yeah, never, never underestimate where people are going to come in if you're creating uh, content to, to, to bring them in. Uh, just on that content piece, David, I, um, I, I liked what you said about, you know, all of us have got, any of us that have worked in business, we've got those questions that we've been asked yeah. over yeah. the years. It doesn't matter whether you've been a recruiter for six months or six years. There's always like, we know the questions that clients and candidates ask yeah. us. And yeah. I love what you said there, which was, you know, to create content around the question that's going off in the prospect's mind yeah. is a very, very easy way to think about new content. It's like, okay, what are the most common questions I ask? I get asked. The, the other one that I would add to that is perhaps the questions that you would like your prospects to ask, i.e., you know, we I know. Would define that. I would okay. the, the questions that they should be asking. They should be asking. Absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely right. The the ones they should be asking that gets out the information that is really yeah, gonna. Yeah. You used the words earlier on, or, or Ian did about differentiating um, yeah. us from the the, the you know the, the the rest of the world. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, in terms of video, I, I've, got a, I've got a third type as well. Uh, okay, cool. More clients. So just to recap quickly, so we've got the questions that they normally ask. You got the questions that they should be asking, but you also should create content that overcome objections, right? As yeah. well, uh, yeah. and that's what I've been working with a couple of clients, and we've find, been finding that really, really good. Right. Um, so people can slot their various videos or whatever content into those three categories. So especially when you're selling stuff, whether it's a service, a widget or whatever, if you have content that overcomes objections, that yeah. removes those objections once they go to your sales page or whatever uh, to buy your product or so, sign up for your service or whatever. So, so just an example, example there. there for... getting different, thing, different bits of content at different stages of the sales process. So early right. on, it's the questions that they, they have in their mind or they should be asking. Later on, as they've got past that and they're getting yeah. near to buying, you're hitting the objections. If you exactly. were talking to them face to face, they would ask those questions and you'd answer them. Yeah. Not they're on a they're on a web page, so you're answering them through video. I, I I really, really like that. Thank you. Thank you, both of you. And and I think that really resonates in terms of um I, I was thinking there for the recruiters that that are in here, and I should mention a few of them. I know I've got Stephen O'Donnell in the room, I know I've got the guys from Firefish. Um, I'm looking and seeing so many uh so many recruiters some i don't know and that's you know wonderful and really pleased that to have you here um but for the recruiters in the room um an example of that question uh, or the objection that david walsh just mentioned there could be along the lines of um you know if i go down the executive search route why why should i do that why should i retain a recruitment agency as opposed to just going out and, and and working with you know five or ten of them why should i retain one so if that question you know is an objection in their head if you can produce content whether it's video whether it's an email whether it's a blog post that answers that specific question um i mean wow I, i'm kind of thinking that's a brilliant idea i'm gonna get that one down uh, can i can i share one uh a please do uh, Please video. Do, and it was something like this it, um again in, in in video form which he then sent to it they it was a husband and wife team sent to the sent to the list and it was something like are you a hiring manager looking for top professional salespeople? but are you frustrated with being inundated with recruiters sending your cvs that are inappropriate and making calls to you um and wasting your time and in fact costing you lots of money but it doesn't have to be that way but it's really talking about the client's problem and saying look we understand your problem. There's a report here that can share with you exactly how to overcome how to overcome that problem, and that proved extremely successful. And again, very clever. They didn't talk about themselves at all. 
They simply talked about the problem the yeah. client was having and how frustrating. And as you know, with, with copywriting, you, you agitate the problem, talk about the implications of that problem. And that's all they did in the video. It's only two or three minutes long extremely successful and what they also yeah. did is they posted it in, in groups on on linkedin saying look if you're a hiring manager uh, looking for uh, software salespeople, you really ought to watch this it's two or three minute video but very very popular got a ton of leads from it as well yeah because they're they're entering the conversation that that person's having in their head so they go oh my god you know what i'm thinking yeah yeah so that and that's why that's going to close so well because no one else is or most people aren't addressing that that conversation that they're having yeah, brilliant. Absolutely Excellent. brilliant. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, look, I should mention as well, Mr. David Frosdick is in the room. He's not He's not up here as a guest. And, and uh, David, thank you. I'm so glad that you made it. David's uh, contributing. I can see him in the chat section there. Uh, one of the things that he said was he revealed that he was with me when we searched for that video. So yeah, we were we were filming together. He didn't know, I didn't know. We YouTubed it, and I think eventually we we worked out how to put the bloody thing away. Uh, so it was a true story. Everyone kind of worries. They go, oh yeah, Roy, maybe you made that up. It's like no, it was that stupid. Um, uh, I What's mentioned one of the advantages of telling your embarrassing stories. Nobody worries about whether you made it. You wouldn't make that up, would you? <laughs> <laughs> it's too daft to make up i think that's the uh that's the key yeah, thing there yeah, you can't make it up um listen i also know that we've had a couple of people that have said hi Stephen." Uh, Stephen though donald was saying saying hello um a couple of people said that they've uh th th loving the show but they've had to go wendy mcdougall at firefish no worries at all she's got a wee one she's got to get to bed uh i think alan um has said alan hiddleston has said the same thing so guys thank you for joining us i, I you know I, I know you'd have got a lot out of this um any of our experts i i do realize we have gone slightly over on time if any of you do need to go please don't feel obliged to hang on till the bitter end um uh, I, I know david frosdick will jump into any of the seats that are vacated so don't don't feel that you've got to stay there but david i know will also be happy to sit in the wings until uh, uh until my dying breath so um, well, Roy, i'm gonna have to jump off in about five minutes so before oh. I jump off, i'm gonna I i'd like to um offer this uh free book Ooh, yeah uh, to everybody uh, apart from you ian i'm gonna send oh, you a new man book. but everybody else <laughs> Everyone else, I'll, I'll give, it, give it for free. So if you go to uh, www.drewcoaching.com, uh, put your details in there, and we'll send this book to you. I wish it will land on your doorstep with a third. It's called <laughs> The Persuasion, Influence, and Sales Recipe for Recruitment and Search Firm Owners. And it's how to generate leads. Once you get the leads, how to convert those leads, how to the, the right language to use. Uh, there's templates in here. Um, go to www.drewcoaching.com. And we will deliver it to you anywhere in the world. All we ask you to do is to pay for postage. Roy's paying for the book. You're paying for postage. <laughs> Things fair to me, Roy. <laughs> Over and to you, Ian. Ian. You're paying for your own book. <laughs> Jerry, listen, that's really kind of you, apart from the me paying for it. But thank you. Listen, I, on behalf of everybody in here, and I know you've got a load of... Uh, people loving and showing the appreciation appreciation for you now. Terry, thanks for joining us. Um, I don't, yeah, listen, we've really, really loved having you on. And um, David's put up the drewcoaching.com link in there. So anyone thanks, th that can click on that, thanks for doing that, David. Bless you. Um, I don't know how we, in fact, it must be, Terry, I'm going to say goodbye, I think. Or actually, can Dee do it? Listen, Terry's, uh, Terry, D's going to magically make you disappear and then magically... Uh, <laughs> he went. <laughs> oh, didn't even say bye-bye. That was like, didn't and, say goodbye, yeah. And Dave, David Walker has been promoted, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to say goodbye as well. Oh, um, no. so, so D, D can wash me away too. <laughs> D's going to wish you. You know what it's like, David? You, do you ever watch, um, what's his face? Uh, the Irish comedian, uh, not comedian, the presenter that's got the red chair. Graham. Graham, Graham Norton. Graham 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 yeah, He's got yeah, that yeah. seat. Go on, D. Flip me. Flip me, D. D. Go on. Flip David Walsh. Come on. David, listen, Ooh. thank you so much for joining. <laughs> thank Thanks, guys. Talk to you later. Yeah. Listen, no worries. Thank you, David. Bless you. All right. Bye. Listen, everyone else that's listening, we're going to try and get 
um, David Frosdick into the room. Let me see if I can. And actually, if there's anyone that wants to ask a question, we've got Ian in, and you know, we've sadly. Oh, actually, have I just knocked David out? Let's You've see. just kicked him out, man. Did I? <laughs> <laughs> and he's back again. Okay, I don't know. I think, I think it just takes David... a few seconds to come through. There you go. Ah, oh, okay, good. Yay! <laughs> like a comedy sketch listening to you three, four. Oh, man, it's... It, it's <laughs> it's more like Celebrity it's... Squares. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and David, if you say... D- David, if you say anything wrong, we're going to do the red lever on you. I man. know, I just know. Like... Yeah, I saw it. Yeah. Terry's got a boot. He didn't even say goodbye. <laughs> Hang on a second. Let me just punch you in. Hold on. <laughs> Other way. Other you way. see, it depends. You're on, you're on the other side of me. That's better. <laughs> and don't you yeah. start, David Frosdick. I'll, I'll, I'll definitely, or is it down that? I don't yeah, know. I don't know where you are, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, listen, for people that really don't... Funny? We both had the exact same pen, and I would do that. <laughs> and as I and did that, it would be... Yeah. Oh, do you know what, Ian? We've got to work on that routine. We work on that one for the next one. The next blab that we do. Yeah, we'll, we can poke we'll do that Roy's ear or something. Like that. <laughs> and out the other end. <laughs> yeah, yeah um, actually, yeah, let's just try this. D- David, you stick your hand off to one side, I and then you stick pen it pen on here. the other. Yeah. That's an orange one, actually. <laughs> David, you poke off to one side with your finger. I don't know which that looks side I'm supposed to be on. Exactly. <laughs> Up the right. nostrils, right. Okay, listen, on a serious note, um, and I know there are still people in this room, so we'll keep going. Um, David Frosdick, welcome to the room. David, you. you're you're a really popular speaker. People have asked a lot about landing pages. Right. And um, But before we get started on that, David, t- tell people, for the people that don't know who you are, who the hell are you? <laughs> um, David. Uh, so yeah, landing page marketing. I've been in the sort of internet marketing world for a while. I worked a long time with Membergate as a membership solution software for years. And I got lucky enough to see behind some of the biggest sites on the web, like run by the top gurus, you know, back in the day, like talking five, seven, ten years ago, these guys were just starting on the web and got to see a lot of like some tactics from people. Um, very big players that probably in the internet marketing world or now in the sort of business coaching world, you know, people names that are recognized. And then from that, just sort of freelancing clients, helping you find videos on YouTube for holding, folding up these screens. I think it's still the same screen behind you probably, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, and it's sort of got it now. You've got to come around and help me fold it now. No, well, I'll send the video to D. One sec, I'll just fire it over there. <laughs> Yeah, and it's now working with Optimize Press. So, like, we're doing all their content for them. Interviewed Mr. Ian Brody there himself, um, geez, six months ago now. But, um, yeah, so doing the content. Drew's site, I was just looking at Drew Coaching. I've got it up here. That is an Optimize Press site. He's using Optimize Press theme, actually, on his site. He's got a landing page in the top section, um, or it's like a landing header he's got there. Or, you know, some people switch these around. It could be like an upside-down landing page. So, yeah, that's really what we specialize in, landing page stuff. And... It's not widely used, I don't think, enough in recruitment. Uh, I think people are just used to getting on the phone and, you know, chatting. And sorry, going back to what you were saying when you were talking right the way back, to, um, even before Rihanna and stuff, <laughs> and you were saying about the personal connection with people are having, no one's mentioned Snapchat yet. And I can't believe that. Like, you know, you've got the population of up to like, 18 to 24-year-olds using it. And this is massive for recruiters, right? Who, uh, you, you, you're, you're the voice of youth, David. <laughs> yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> I thought so I snapped you guys before I come in and sent it on there. And I was just like, I don't know how, why recruiters aren't using this yet. I know they could easily fire out quick jobs. They just got a hit record, you know, like I can get you guys on here. If you wave, if you want to wave, there you go. Look, so we're on Snapchat, you know, and you can just post something up. It takes like, so you just click, you know, it's gone. That's on the web. If you've got a followers, a bunch of followers that are following you through your recruitment business, you could fire out jobs left, right, and center and, Brilliant. you know, find dedicated people who, if they're on there and they're getting alerts from your, you know, your job descriptions and things and come through. And one thing is you've got to keep up with technology, especially in like recruiters. Some of them are, you know, they're up there with it, but a lot of people are falling behind or they think they haven't got enough time to go in and look at these new technologies and things. And I mean, a lot of it starts at landing pages, which is what I do, but there's so much other stuff that it could be used to generate leads or just find, you know, find people who are, wanted you know the perfect or the ideal client or whatever for your job so yeah yeah david david thank you, thank you. I, I, it's, it's really interesting, interesting. You have, you have, you have, you have oh roy you've gone a bit funny there oh, really? Oh, really? Alien oh, yeah. 
Can you hear me, Can now? You hear me now? No. You're, you're like a Dalek. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> try, 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 try. Can, can hear me now? Hear me now. <laughs> Yeah, you, we can hear you, but you sound like a Dalek. It's like, all right, um, all right. I could record you, it, maybe. You talk, you talk whilst I, 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 I try to sound. Okay, sound. you probably want to disconnect, Roy, and I'm not in your house to help you fix this. Um, yeah, that's a, that's an interesting thing about Snapchat there, though, David. I mean, obviously, clearly, this is not going to get you, you know, um, 57-year-old senior executives checking their Snapchat while they're having, uh, having a posh meal. But, you know, if you're recruiting young people into, into yeah. various roles... Um, and the other advantage is if no one else is using it, you'll be the only one hitting them through that channel. Exactly. And that's that's always the thing to weigh, weigh up. I mean, a lot of people go, oh, well, yeah, but there won't be lots of people using it. But if you're the only one reaching them, you don't need lots because yeah. you get 100% of that smaller market. That's like going back to you, you should know exactly where your leads are coming from mm. before you start trying to reach them or, or put something in front of them or put a landing page or whatever it is in front of them. So, yeah, it's um, keeping up with you like to say is that the youth is in snapchat it's just a huge younger generation you know facebook is just not cool enough for some of the young kids but they'll still be looking for jobs you know they're going to be out there coming out of college or in college you know about to leave they're looking for apprenticeships and things like that it's definitely a place that, you know recruiters could jump on that space and get in there and you know help um or just help their own business get you know more awareness so roy are you back no, he's not. I'll tell you what, the one question Roy was going to ask was about um, landing pages and home pages. So okay. um, I think the question was going to be for recruiters, why should they use dedicated landing pages instead of just sending people to their home page? Yeah, I suppose initially it'd be you could either I know Roy has this you have clients and candidates, you have this big divide mm -hmm. between the two separate sort of entities that are leads that are coming in. Um, a home page is great. People land on it. You know, they can see some general inform information about your business. You know, they can see what, you know, what you do, what you sell, what niche you're in. Um, the thing about a landing page is there's usually only one call to action on that page, and that's to get a name and email address from that person to follow up and nurture them and educate them about your recruitment business. You know, and a home page is great. You know, you can find stuff about us. You can contact us. But well, it's the hardest page, page to do a home page because yeah. it, has, it has to it has the most general audience with the most different things you've got to guess yeah. at what they're doing. Whereas with a landing page, if you can dedicate traffic to it, you know why they're coming and you've just got one thing exactly. you want them to do. Yeah, it's one action for them to take. You know, they don't get lost clicking around here. They don't go here. They go there looking for something else. You just put them into one funnel, and after that, you then. You know, if it's a specific thing they're looking for, a specific job, then you tell them about that job. You give them information about that job and you follow up with content to get to know these people. You know, that I was speaking with Roy before, it's about building a relationship with these people. They're going to be life, they could be lifelong, you know, customers to a recruitment agency, especially the fact that, you know, fair enough, they might go on and go and work for someone for a couple of years. You know, further down the line, they might then try and, you know, what, you know they want to progress their career. So if you've got a relationship with these people, they're going to come back to you hopefully you know so so you're like, flashing you're like away there take some straight into email marketing which is what we were kind of talking about yes yeah exactly um and we just had a question in over the over on the right from david gittos about what what's the best software to use for email marketing um it's and, one for you yeah I, it, you know what it depends the best software is they all say the best camera is the one you have with you yeah um, so there's no I'm an active campaign saying you know the best software for email marketing is marketo and hubspot because it's really <laughs> expensive and you're never going to use it uh, yeah. so the best software for email marketing is the one that you can use and find easy to use yeah. um having said that you know my preference and the one i use is a tool called active campaign um i think there are different levels of email marketing software. There, there is um, the, what you could guess call the entry level systems. So things like Mailchimp and yeah. Aweber, the well known ones that just have basic functionality where they allow people to sign up and get emails from you. Campaign Monitor is probably in the in, in the middle there. It's got kind of basic functionality. It's aimed at uh, Campaign got Monitor features. specifically target people who are like nicely designed, kind of pretty emails. Some of us would argue that doesn't matter, but uh, but they go for that kind of design market. Um, but they've got basic functionality. People sign up. It lets them do that. You can broadcast yeah. emails. You can send them simple autoresponder sequences and a little bit of automation. Now, it used to be that the next level up 
was big complicated software like Infusionsoft or Entreport, mm -hmm. which was combined um, email software and a shopping cart and an affiliate system and a voicemail yeah. thing. And But the key thing it had from the Somebody email perspective watching. was it had automations in the email that were a bit more complex. So instead of just saying send email A, send email yeah. B, send email C, you could do things like send email A. If they click on it, then send email B. But if they don't click on it, send a different email. If they buy this product, send them yeah. a different thing again. If they watch that video, then send them this email to follow up. But if they don't watch it, wait today and send them a reminder. So you had kind of more advanced automations. But there used to be a big gap and, and you know, infusion stuff, okay. not so easy to use. Um, in the middle, it's now been filled now with systems like Active Campaign, with Drip, with Convert Kit. Yeah. Active Campaign, my favorite. But they've all got the advanced automation. They're fairly easy to use. They're still at the same kind of pricing level as the Airwebers and the MailChimps. But they don't have the shopping carts and all the additional things that Infusionsoft, et cetera, have. So for me, if you're just doing email marketing, you know, if you're a recruiter, you don't want people to hit it, use a shopping cart and buy stuff. That's not the way they buy. So you don't need that. And it's unlikely you have an affiliate system. Yeah. So things like Active Campaign, Convert Kit, Drip could be great for you. Um, the one thing to say, though, is the bottom level systems are building functionality. So MailChimp are adding in um, the ability to do better automations. Aweber are trying to add that. They're redoing yeah. the system. The it's going to take them a while because they've got to kind of re rehash yeah. it. It's like trying to rewrite Microsoft Office. It's going to take them a <laughs> yeah. long time because yeah. it's big and complex. Um, I think Aweber have definitely lost people due to like active campaign and these yeah. guys coming out because they're trying to catch up with that whole tagging system, uh, yeah. which obviously active campaign you know got from what it get from. But they you know they followed on that principle mm. of infusion. So mm. I think the key for recruiters would be hi Roy, you're back again. You're flashing for a while here on screen. We can't hear you though. You're 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 silent. Can hear oh, D. Right. Hi, D. Let's keep going. So what, what's your your yeah, well, I, on I'm email? David? Active campaign. Um, I use it. I you know I tell friends. I tell like Roy and people and clients that I know to go and use active campaign. Wins it for me. The cost. The low cost entry price you know at nine bucks for 500 leads and it, it's just the, the ability to put in automated automated stuff things like when someone clicks a certain link things like when someone visits a certain page on your website to be able to trigger an automated sequence yeah but that's huge power like especially for recruiters if they if they've got job descriptions up and you know certain people are visiting this exact page you know, they could be following up straight away or even notifying teams inside the office to give this person a call. They've you know, visited this page six that's times exactly now. Exactly right. I can't well, remember the exact data, but there was a report out of eConsultancy recently about, um, and they do it, they repeat it all, all the time, but it's uh, they do an analysis of email open rates for kind of broadcast emails versus triggered emails. Okay, yeah. And, and the triggered email is one, you know, if someone's already an email subscriber and they then, as you were just saying, go to a page with a particular job opportunity on it or something like that, if you then trigger an email because you've spotted them going related to that, yeah. the open rates are through the roof compared yeah. to normal, normal emails because it's very specifically related to what they were interested in. It's a bit related to retargeting that mm -hmm. we were talking about earlier, except instead of them seeing a Facebook ad, they get an email about it. You've yeah. got to be a little bit careful you don't spook the heck out of them. Yeah, <laughs> you, well, you know, that's one of yeah. You were browsing my website <laughs> and you clicked on this. They go, oh, my God. But... You might say like a day later or just send them an email saying, hey, would you would you be interested in this? Yeah. And it will, uh, it, you know, and yes, you know they're interested in it. They've they, already visited the, exactly. What they, what, they, what they clicked on or what that's the web page they visited. Yeah. I mean, go and visit a page on Amazon and wait a day, see how they do it, see how they'll word it completely differently. Exactly, but the yeah. point is, you know, look at the times they use. If they use a day, try yours for the day, you know, and look at the big other big companies that do it and also yeah that's like, if you heard that funny story but you know the um the story from the us i think it was tar was it target or one of the, the stores there that had sent out that they'd watched what someone was you know they would watch people's browsing behavior on the site and they would they would send them out voucher coupons okay right post related to that. and they sent the ones that were for you know baby wipes and whatever <laughs> and the guy complained and said how dare you oh uh, yes okay Ch child care to my daughter you're encouraging yeah. her to get pregnant and then about three months later he wrote back and said i have to apologize she was already pregnant <laughs> just you knew you knew from her browsing behavior before we did um what they've discovered it? now is they, they actually deliberately mix things up so they don't just send the vouchers relative to what people have been looking at because that spooks the heck out of them what they do is they mix in a few random things <laughs> so it doesn't look as if they've 
you know, they know too much about them. And then they send vouchers related to a lawnmower and baby wipes. <laughs> you kind of go, oh, well, these are general vouchers, but oh, that one's quite good for me. And so is that. That one's quite good for me as well. So you gotta, you got to be a little bit careful. But, yeah. you know, triggering things based on what people are doing is so powerful. And the active campaign lets you do that. Along, you know, Infusionsoft, if you're in that world as well. Yeah. Guys, can you hear me? Oh, we hi. can now, yeah. Welcome Woo! back. He's back in the room. DLC sorted out that technical issue there. <laughs> I, I've switched to D's computer, David. Oh, perfect. Ah. Um, um, I just see a question come up here from Search UK. Search. Um, about, you know, what should landing pay? I mean, like, uh, Ian is probably just as knowledgeable in this fact as me. It's, a lot of this comes down to testing. The key things I'd say you want on your landing page, you know, you want to have a strong headline followed up with a really good supporting headline. Probably look at the above the fold contents. We mean by that is everything that's above the screen, the first half. And you want to have a visual focal point on that page, which could be either a video, you may be talking about something, or it could be the particular blueprint or the you know interview guide, whatever it is your lead magnet, whatever you're giving away. You know, that wants to be a good a visual focal point. You then just want to have a nice, simple lead capture form. Now, either we get a thing called two-step opt-in, which is when they click a button, something else pops up, the opt-in form, and they fill it out. Or you have an inline opt-in form, which is a form directly on the screen. I read a study actually last week about um, inline, because this whole two-step opt-in thing that was coming out was apparently converting massively. Mm. And someone said the other day, it makes no difference now to their leads, whether an inline form or a two-step yeah, opt-in. And it's um, so lead capture form. And then you've got to go on from there, like whether you're having, you know, if you're going to have a longer landing page, you want to have, you know, benefits on it. You know, leave the features out of it. You want to have benefit driven bullet points about your content. You probably want some kind of privacy statement underneath. Um, I read an interesting case study from, I think, Conversion Excel that when they use the word, we will not spam you in there underneath their opt-in form, they did, you know, declined opt-in rates or they decreased yeah. compared to- People like, weren't thinking the, about spam just, until yeah, they yeah. mentioned it. And instantly, yeah. boom, they just don't sign up. Um, yeah, so good benefits and definitely have, I wouldn't, I don't want to encourage outbound links on a landing page, but you do want to have things like, you know, maybe a link to your contact page or a link to your privacy policy and your terms, maybe, you know, stuff about you. A landing page has really got one sole focus to generate leads and capture leads, but you want to, you know, it's, but certain ad networks, if you're running ads, won't like any of that kind of stuff. Yeah, it depends so you where have, you're coming from, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah you want to have, you, it basically, you just want to be authentic. Don't try and just get a name and email of people. Give them something genuine of high value, potentially something that you would sell. You know, if it's that good, you'd sell it, maybe put it away in a lead magnet. So, yeah, there's, I mean, there's so much stuff about what should go on a correct landing page. You're then talking about length, how long should it be, how short should it be, and it's all depending on your lead magnet offer. So, and it depends on where they're coming from as well. I think that's it. Think about when you are sending people to a landing page. What I found, for example, is if I'm using Facebook advertising, the Facebook advert itself will say what people will get. So the Facebook ad might say yeah. something like, you know, um, exclusive report for consultants and coaches, um, you know, um, get the 21 word, blah, 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 picture of it. So if people click on that ad and come to my landing page, they pretty much have already mentally decided, I want this thing. Right. So I've then found that the simpler the landing page, so whenever I added things like testimonials and extra benefits and bullets, it always made things worse right. because it slowed people down. But if people are coming to the landing page less prepared to do something, you need more persuasion. Yeah. So you you have that's why you have to test really test. because I I've always get it wrong. I you know I'm I, I'm I've never been able to predict. You know, I'll, I'll try two different types of landing page. I'll go, I bet it's this one. It's always the other always one. The other one. Always the other it's one. The same with social media updates or something, isn't it? You, you do when you think this is a great update. I've worked on this. You put it out and no one likes it. You're like, okay, that was. And then well, Olivia, you... what landing page technology do you use? Well, David obviously is going to use Optimize yeah, Press because yeah, it's great absolutely. landing page technology. No, but there's, I mean, there's so many out there now. It really depends on the budget, the functions you want, and really who's doing it in the office. If someone's, you know, technical, you know, could throw something at them which they can use. If someone has no idea what they're doing. And, you know, you maybe find a landing page software that's functional, doesn't require any sort of technical knowledge, or, although they all kind of do at some point. But it's really just, again, find what works for you. Um, Optimized Press is actually a WordPress-based platform. So if you're running WordPress on your site or your recruitment site, then, you know, it's fine. It'll work alongside that. But there's there's more and more coming out every day in this market. So it's kind of the space getting saturated yeah, in a way. Like, it was almost the first big one. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. The first yeah. WordPress one, the... Uh... That, that came along that did and it does it, yeah let's we, we, um i use optimized press to run my membership site so it yeah. does other things as well yeah david but, and Ian, actually just on on this thing of um 
uh, websites and, and, and website builders. There'll be people not necessarily that are in this room right now, but but other recruiters that will watch this afterwards um, that are business startups that have seen the adverts for Wix and thought, oh, you know, this is a great little quick tool. It's cheap. I can knock up a website in seconds. Um, is it a good thing for them to do where it's templated or what would be your advice on that? David first, then Ian, maybe chipping in with your um I, yeah i think wix is a lot more of a website platform and right. again it depends on who's doing all the stuff in the office if you've got a team of 50 people then you could probably dedicate someone a day to learn how to use wix and create pages right. if you're a small team you know if you're a one-man recruiter or a one band you know you might go outsource it and you know get someone to you know go and buy the software and say look throw me up an optimized press landing page they've got all the templates just that's what i want yeah. and Back to like Ian was saying about testing stuff. Yeah. Don't get too hooked up on the whole design, how pretty this looks. It's about generating leads. So if it's yellow, just go with it. If it's purple, if it matches your brand, even better. But just because you want the button green or some guru said make the button orange, you know, don't worry too. Just stick with your branding, keep the same colors and have a nice simple page. Ian said, yeah, the big stuff simple. is having something people want. Yes, that's the lead magnet is the key thing. <laughs> that eureka moment isn't it ian and <laughs> david's laughing because he he's remembering the conversations that i've had with him where i've said to him no i've been told we need to have an orange button he's like no you don't keep it simple stupid yeah the amount, of, the amount of time you could spend worrying I, I must admit i do it myself oh i'll tweak that tiny little color over here yeah. because someone somewhere found it made a huge difference well it, it doesn't for most people those are the exceptions rather than the rule the big stuff is having an offer on there that people really want yeah. and making it really clear to them what it is. Hence the the headline David was talking about before. Great offer with a headline that explains it. Those are the and, and doesn't distract you things. That, those are kind of the basics. And and you know something for the two of you, I know um, David, you've you've spent time around some of my clients, so you, you know you understand something about recruit recruiters. And Ian, I know I know you were saying you know. You don't know the recruitment world, but I know you do have recruitment people following you as well. Um, the, the recruiters have known this, the power of a headline, or good recruiters have known it for, for centuries, or, or at least for as long as recruitment industry has been around, because they've always understood that the, the headline for them was perhaps the job title of an advert. Um, you know, and and the not so clever ones would have just put up, you know, accountant required or whatever. Yeah. But the really smart ones have, have recognised that, you know, in order for people to to in order for people to be captured on a page or sea of advertising, their headline needs to really stand out. It needs to jump in and capture the you know the the heart and soul of somebody and get them not necessarily to click back in the old days, but to pick up a phone or to pop into your office or whatever. You're not going to ask us what the best headline is. No, no, I won't do that to you at all. Ah. It's, it's really interesting because I think us as an industry, the recruitment industry, um, with the whole technology piece, we lost our way a little bit with that. We used to be so good as an industry at writing great headlines that would capture people and, encourage them and motivate them enough to pick up the phone and, and, and talk about changing their job or placing a job with us. But we lost it a little bit. And I think, you know, the message that I put out there to, to, to recruiters a lot, and I know people like Stephen O'Donnell know this, uh, do this as well a lot, is just keep putting out this thing that, that actually we do need to stand out. You know, in a sea of mediocrity, it's not difficult to, um, but we still need to do it. You know, yeah. we need to be putting out stuff that's compelling and, um, Ian, you I think part of that, I think a key thing there is to really understand what your, you know, either the the hiring firms or the individuals looking looking to be hired, what they really want, you know, what what are they really there for? The deeper your understanding of your um, clients, your target clients, the easier it becomes to write something yeah. that will connect with them. Yeah. I've always found that my worst headlines, um, or when I've had a passing knowledge of who it is I'm writing for. And you end up with generalities or you end up making stupid claims. I remember probably the worst headline I think I ever wrote years ago was for a, I wrote an ebook, one of the very first things I ever did. It was about getting referrals. Right. I started out learning and, and knowing and, and doing a lot of work in the area of referrals. And I wrote an ebook about getting about referrals. So then when I was promoting it, I think I, I wrote the headline was something like, you know, get a flood of referrals for your business or whatever. And, and and I looked at that afterwards and thought, that just sounds like every other 
person trying to sell get rich quick get a flood of new clients get a and of course people want a flood of but 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 of course they want more than just i want more than just referrals why do i want referrals yeah. is it because I, i'm t i'm too embarrassed to ask for referrals so you know that in which case it would be you know get more referrals even if you're too frightened to ask or whatever it might be so look for the real things they're looking for underneath the less you know about people the more you have to say get this thing it's great and it's wonderful honestly the more you understand the more you can prod the specific thing exactly they want or they fear ian i think you're spot on with that you reminded me as well of um one of the first company names i ever came up with uh, not for recruitment business, but, you know, lastly, I, even my recruitment businesses weren't that great. But for my training company, I remember when I first launched a training company 150 years ago, um, I called it 8020 Vision. And, and I know you two will appreciate this, but you're probably the only other two people in the country, neither the world, that would, that understood the Pareto principle. And it's like, oh, yeah, wow, man, that's so clever. But unfortunately, what sounded really clever in my head was completely missed by the audience that I was going for. I got calls thinking I was a bloody optician. You know, <laughs> you know, where can I can I get an eye test? A um, good name for recruitment who was in that niche, right? <laughs> Brilliant. I should have sold it. Yeah, yeah. It, it really does highlight that thing that you've got to understand the market that you sell to. And you also don't want to be too clever, you know, trying to do something that you think, oh, my God, you know, that that headline is so clever, it excites me. Me is actually unimportant. It's the people that I want to have responding to me that are the most important. Mm. I think that's what I got out of what you just said. That, that, that clever stuff as well. I remember I went on my very first copywriting course um, with a guy called Andy Maslin about nine years ago. Right. And I remember that the, the biggest thing I learned from it was we all sat in a room, all of us kind of learning to write copy. And the immediate thing that happened when we he said, right, you know, write a quick ad, write you write a headline for this, you're promoting it. And everyone to a there was about a dozen of us, and every single one of us tried to write something clever, right. fun, something, you know, that alliterated. And to us, the creativity of it, the cleverness of it was more important than actually a clear message getting through. And that's the right. absolute reverse of what good copywriting is about. Good copywriting isn't about being clever. It's about, of course, if you could be clever and get the message through, great. But the first step is get a clear message through about what people would want. Yeah. There's a, I think I put on the Optimized Press blog, um, it's about the perfect headline where you have like a number, an, ad an adjective, and then like a solution or something like that. And you create, you know, you, by looking at that sort of equation, you can come up with a good headline. Um, I'll just quickly find it now, but it's, it's perfect for people if they're struggling with headlines. It was kind of actually um, something simple, yeah. Yeah, it they, wasn't. We, by we've, had, we've had a question about emails be, becoming spam. Um, the it says, at what point does the do emails sent through lead pages become spam? Um, basically, spam is in the eye of the beholder. There's some legal definitions of spam which vary by country, so you know know what they are in your country. The old information commissioner lives about 100 yards away from me, sets the rules in the UK. It's a can't spam act in America. There's a Canadian one, CASL, et cetera. Lots of rules around the world. So comply with those rules. So if you're in Germany, you have to use double opt-in. If you're in the UK, you don't. Um, but once people have signed and given you their email, really it's all about if someone gets an email from you and they think it's spam, it is spam. Right. Because they're going to hit the spam button and they're or they're going to start ignoring it, etc. So the thing to think about is make sure all your emails are valuable and interesting. If you are sending emails that are valuable and interesting to people and they open them and they enjoy them and they find them useful, that's great. They're not spam. Now, you can't please everyone all the time. So that does mean you need it. Firstly, try and get only the people who you know will be interested in what you have to say to sign up. So don't get them to sign up on false pretenses. So firstly, we, we talk about lead magnets, a, you know, a great free report, et cetera, to get people to sign up. Do also say, use the and word and say, get your, you know, seven seven biggest mistakes that recruiters make report, or sorry, seven biggest mistakes that hiring companies make, um, hiring executives, and my regular and our regular tips on hiring the best people. So right. it shouldn't be a surprise to them when they start getting emails from you. Um, if they say if they can't just expect that one thing and then it to stop, you need to tell them they'd also be getting your regular emails. Make sure your regular emails are on the topic that they signed up for, 
not some completely superfluous topic. And in a lot of marketing fields, people do get down the track. If someone approaches them and says, oh, you've got a, an audience of senior executives. Well, we could also sell them stress reduction, et cetera, and that. And you're going, well, yeah, they could deal with stress reduction too. But that's not what they signed up for. They signed up for your tips on how to hire the right people or whatever it might be you're writing about. So keep on topic for them. Um, make sure they're interesting and make sure they're valuable and then it won't be spam. Make it easy for people to unsubscribe, obviously, because if they decide they don't want them anymore, um, if you keep getting them, they're going to see them as spam. So don't hide the unsubscribe. And the great advice there, Ian. And it's interesting because I, I learned something very early on Um in my email marketing education, and it was from you, I was a subscriber to you. Yeah, yeah, um, one of the things, Ian. Um, <laughs> I received an email from you, and the email said, um, I, I, I'm trying to kind of, I'm paraphrasing it, it was basically, well, you haven't clicked on my emails, I'm gonna assume that, you know, you, you, you don't wanna be part of this anymore. Um, and it was almost like it was a goodbye. Mm. And and my first response was, oh, my God, Ian's upset with me. So I wrote back <laughs> telling you what was going on in my life. And it's like why, why I hadn't opened up every single email from you and everything else. But I, I, I recognize and what I learned from it is it's you keeping your list really clean. Mm. Um, something David and I were talking about earlier on today. David, perhaps you should come in on it. But um, it is about and I think it's it's something that you. And, and people that are really smart with their email marketing do quite often, isn't it? Yeah, you've got to be. I mean, there are various points of view on this. What you have to balance is, is a couple of things. And it's become more extreme in recent years. So if people are on your email list and not opening your emails and not clicking them, etc., there's a temptation to think, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't yeah. matter because it's not going to do any harm. But these days it does do harm because the big email systems, particularly Gmail, and Gmail run about 40% of the world's email. Um, even though it doesn't say Gmail on it, yeah. which if you check your list, there'll be a lot of them are jar Gmail, probably 20 30% will say Gmail. But but behind the scenes, it's running a lot of more corporate email systems. Yeah, yeah, and Gmail cool. will look, and Yahoo, et cetera, do, do, and Outlook do this as well. They look across all the emails that you're sending, and if nobody's opening your email, then they'll start thinking, well, it's spammy. Yeah. Because nobody's opening it. Nobody's clicking on it. And they have all sorts of engagement metrics. Use. Click is not one, actually. They think that's an invasion of privacy if they check too much on what you're clicking. But they right. do check, are you opening it? Are you scrolling all the way down it? For example, how long is it open for? And they'll use those metrics. It varies by system. But they'll use that to make a judgment on you as a whole, as a sender. Are people engaged with these emails? And if they're not, then on Gmail, you'll end up in the promotions tab or you'll end up as spam in, in, in the other system or, or spam in Gmail. So having one open your emails is not a good thing. Mm. Um, having them, can I interrupt there, Ian? Mm. Having them to reply is like the best thing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Trigger if they reply. see you've replied to one of them emails, they're like, wow, this, they need to see this email. When That's he right. emails. They'll, if they reply, and if you reply twice, I think, is the rule on Gmail, yeah. you automatically go in the contacts list. So, you're so that's why you see these marketers writing hit reply or something. If you want, you know, reply to this email and I'll be, you know, because they get to reply, which, uh, you know, you carry more weight in that person's inbox, which is, is, is good as well. Absolutely. I mean, typically what I'll do is when people first sign up, firstly, uh, if I can, depends on the context and if I want them, to, if there's something else I want them to do more. But if I, if I can, I'll say to them, you know, whitelist my email so put yeah. my email on your contact list move it yeah. from the primary tab promotions tab to primary if that's happened um i'll often send an initial email the very first time they get it which basically lays out the relationship so i can it, it pushes the wrong word but i'll basically say hey look here's the deal i'm going to try and send you my best emails i hope you find them useful um, i've worked for a long time to make really you know um to create my best material i think is going to be helpful to you help you get more clients if you know if I miss, if I miss the spot, tell me. Send me an email. I'll, I'll write about other stuff. Um, if I hit the spot, tell me. I like good feedback. Um, here's your side of the deal. You know, um, well that's their side of the deal. Give me feedback. Um, but also, you know, be, please be aware. I make my living by by selling things yeah. <laughs> to people on my email list. So if every now and then I do promote a product, you know, please don't get upset. That's part of the deal. If you're not okay with that, then you can unsubscribe at any time. And it kind of if people read that and people have replied and said, yeah that's fair enough i I'm, I'm happy with that it means that that you know they don't get upset if you try and promote anything 
Um, so that's the first thing. The next thing I'll often do is um, if I've sent them a lead magnet, I'll set the first email after that will be, hey, did you get it? Please hit reply and say whether you did or not. Right. And not only, as David says, that gets you kind of whitelisted. It also gets a conversation going, which is brilliant. Yeah. So, so they say, yeah, I did. Thanks. I've read it. It's brilliant or whatever. Oh, did you read page 52? You get a conversation going with people. Yeah. Fantastic. And then as you found out, Roy, usually after either 30 or 60 days, if someone hasn't replied, hasn't has an open email. Now, the open statistics are not 100% accurate. So often they kind of open them and read them, but you just don't know. Right. Um, but if someone hasn't opened or hasn't clicked after 30 days, I'll, nowadays I send a, are you okay message. That's so it. I basically go, you know, are you okay? I'm okay, I know right. My system says you haven't you, you know you haven't opened or anything for a little while. Could be my system's wrong, but I just wanted to check, make sure everything was okay, make sure you're still interested. You know, if not, I don't want to be sending you emails you're not interested in. And loads of people come back and they're like, you did they apologize or they say, you know, yeah, I'm just busy, etc. So firstly, that gets a reply, so I'm more likely to get in the inbox. But secondly, if they've read that and they go, oh, yeah, I'll be sure to read more of them. Um, they're more likely to read more of them on an ongoing basis. And thirdly, you know, it shows I'm a human being. We get in a conversation. Another 30 days after that, if they still haven't done much, I start sending fewer emails. I don't stop sending completely no. because the other side of the coin is there will be some people who will barely read anything for two years and eventually buy something from you. <laughs> we, we all know that. You have been out of touch with people for years. So what, what I think works for me is decrease the frequency because right. when it comes to the email systems, it's the average engagement. Rate. So if you're sending more emails to the people who are opening them and less emails to the people who aren't, then on average, your open rate is very high. Mm. So you don't have to completely cut out sending the ones to the people who aren't opening them because one of them might or it's just not measuring it right or whatever. So it's a that's a little bit advanced. Um, Ian, you know something that 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 is advanced. But I think for a lot of recruiters listening to this and watching this either live or the recording, um, I think really resonates because the life cycle for a candidate or and the buying cycle for, for a candidate or a client can be extremely long yeah. it's like, you know if you talk about the working career of any individual I don't know 20 30 40 years even and a, a good recruitment consultant a good recruiter can place the same candidate four five six times in, in a lifetime yeah. a good recruiter can work with a client you know multiple multiple times but they're not going to be buying from them every single day. You know, the nature of the job is if I place somebody, hopefully they're going to stay there. At least. Keeping a long-term relationship exactly. going. Yeah, absolutely. Like, is that... So that, I mean, if you do it, if you were doing it manually, yes. you'd be doing that anyway, wouldn't you? You'd, yeah. you'd notice, you know, I haven't spoken to someone. You wouldn't be emailing someone all the time then. If I haven't spoken to John, it's probably about the right time, isn't it? Okay, I'll get back into it. I'll see how he is. And if John comes back and says, you know what, I'm mulling over, then you start sending more emails because he's interested. Well, nowadays, um, looking at some of the things where David and I were talking about, about tagging and things on systems, right. you can do that automatically as well. Yeah. You can do when, when people are showing interest, if they're clicking on the links, if they're going to visit web pages, you can just ramp up and send them more emails about that particular topic. So a simple thing is, you know, if you were going to write them an email about, um, you, know, five, you know, the biggest mistakes um, when it comes to hiring very senior executives, chairman, et cetera, Sure. Um, send them one email about the five biggest you know, five biggest mistakes. If they open that and they click the link to go and read the blog post, send them some more about that. Or even say, hey, if you're interested, I'll send you more about very senior executives. If you're not, don't bother, do, don't do anything, and I won't send you them. Mm -hmm. And that way what happens then is the people who clicked and who were interested in very senior executives or you know whatever the particular topic was, they get more emails about that. And because they're interested, they'll open them. You get very high open rates, and you're not you're then not hitting – so you can send more emails, you can send even more frequently, and you're not hitting the guys who aren't interested with emails that they ju just aren't on the right topic. So that lets you send very topic-specific emails and still know that you'll get a good open rate rather than even if the topic is only of interest to a, to a minority of the people in your audience. Right. Sure. Back to that tagging thing, even like if, I'm sure if someone was to get, a, just like say if using Active Campaign to your email tool, um, I don't know what the other CRMs do in you know the recruitment, but like if someone gets a job, you place a position, you know, you can take them, remove them from the list, or remove them, put them, tag them into a, where they get automated and say yeah. put into a list where you're only going to connect with these people once every six months. Right. You could even set an automated notification that comes into member of staff saying, right, it's now been a year for this guy. Follow up a year later, just check out how he's doing. Do they want a career change? Are they looking to progress in that career? You know, and that's where automation, this email, can totally help 
with even reminders and things of business that you can just forget that someone a year later, if you had their relationship with them, you know, you might follow up and that's a perfect time. That guy could be looking, that girl could be looking for the next career path. And if you're again in front of them at that time, you know, you don't, it doesn't, you don't have to place them straight away. But if you just make a connection, engage, how's your job going? The job's going great. Perfect. You won't hear from us for another year then or however long. The point is something has automated that, you know, trigger to tell a member of staff or D- someone. David, really interesting because I think you've kind of answered the question that came up here from S. Uh, Rasheen. Um, I, you know, and I think you both kind of cover this in terms of, you know, what frequency of emails is not too spammy. And, and what I'll throw into the mix here is that from a recruitment point of view, if a candidate contacts us and they are responding to a, jo- a job advert, at that particular moment in time, that person is highly motivated to hear about new jobs. Yeah. Once they're placed or they've found their own job, they are less interested to hear about yeah. other jobs. They're curious. There's always going to be this curiosity. Mm. So under the monetary value, but they don't care. Right, They've like, exactly. got a job. Right. And and clients are the same. You know, again, to, to S. Rashim's um, point here, I would say try to think about the temperature of the people that are coming into uh, your, your your business in whatever form or fashion they're coming in. So the client places a job with you, at that particular time, they're very motivated to get that particular job filled. Once it's filled, you don't want to be speaking to them every single day because you will come across as um, spammy. You're, 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 you're selling to somebody that doesn't want to buy. I think Terry made that point. That's a really, that is a really good point. The, uh, the thing I would say generally about this, though, is generally speaking, most people are not emailing enough. Yeah, um, yeah you're right. Right. Terry said it earlier, you know, he's never found anyone he's worked with where he's increased the frequency of email and they've got worse results. Yeah, yeah. Some people Most get more sales. Us, and you know, kind of yeah, stuff. exactly. I mean, very few of us are emailing as often as we could do, especially yeah. if we're really writing, you know, if you're writing really good, high quality emails with useful information that are interesting to people, um, then sure. it's rare that you'll be sending too many. Yeah. Um, and people are, and the one thing to bear in mind, of course, is people's, I mean, you Roy, you talked about the advanced version there in terms of depends on individuals. But if you were to look at people on average, you know, there's probably some kind of normal distribution curve. Right. And there will be some people who will read as many emails as you can send because they love what you're sending. There'll be some people who don't want any from you at all, really. And, you know, even a few is too many. Most people somewhere in the middle. Now, the danger is if you listen to feedback, the feedback you get is from the people who you're sending too many to. But that's the one end of the distrib- of the normal curve. You've got to think about the rest. And most of them, um will be will will be will be happy with that you're saying if you're not hearing from them you know if you're not hearing anyone complaining it means you're emailing so infrequently that even the tail end of the normal distribution <laughs> keep going. getting upset you need a few people complaining about the frequency otherwise it's not enough so, and like you said earlier if they don't subscribe they go that's fine i'll yeah. be talking about like you know if you're not the person you're not the leader for that person that's fine let them yeah. Yeah, they'll move on. So, you know, I, w- I would say once a week is absolutely reasonable. Um, it, I mean, as, as Roy was saying earlier, if you can vary it based on, you know, we've just placed them, they don't need this. So, you know, we take them off that list. And yeah. so, so you know, if you if people were looking for a job actively, once a day would be fine. Absolutely fine. If they're looking for a job, a daily bulletin, mm, great. Definitely. If you've That's... placed them, take them off the daily bulletin, maybe put them on a, you know, a monthly, put them on a specific sequence, a how you're doing in your new role sequence. Yeah. So, you know, a week into the new job start date, send them send them a, how's it going? Is there anything we can do for you to help you with your transition? Don't try and sell them anything, but try and help them. And, and you can be communicated on a regular basis like, like that. So if you're being advanced, you can do it fairly intelligently. Ian, I'm going to jump in on that point. I'm, I'm so conscious of time and for two reasons. Ah, First, right. yeah, I know, Ian's just noticed. Um, so the generosity of, of both of you. And secondly, and most pressingly, David should really be on a on a plane somewhere. To throw <laughs> I'll up get to that. Gatwick in like thirty minutes. Okay. So I need to... <laughs> so what what I'm going to do is, I, and this is you know testament to the to the two of you, the generosity of you in terms of staying and and talking about a subject that you're both very very passionate about, and I love that. Thank you. Um, I'm going to encourage everybody that's still in this room um, to do two things. First of all show 
Focus Appreciation for Ian Brody and David Frosdick. All right. So it, it, the two little hands, if you haven't done this, just tick, tick the two little... <laughs> Am I going to get it in the right place, there? Click here. <laughs> Is it a lad? No, you're there. doing the there volume. You go, <laughs> oh, bless you. Thank you, Dave. Can I click myself? Is there you go. No, you can't. No, you can't click yourself, do you? Well, that's good. Um, and, and, and for everyone that's noticing, they're thinking, oh, hang on a second, Ian Brody's really popular with 357. <laughs> He's got 51. Roy's only got Roy's really popular at all, is he? Yeah, no, I know. What happened there? Poor content. Because, yeah, it's not big enough. <laughs> so clearly, the, uh, there's correlation there, mate. <laughs> um, this is on behalf of, of, of everybody. <laughs> We've had Thank another you. Gordon's Alive. <laughs> <laughs> Gordon's Alive! <laughs> I missed that joke. I've got no idea what you two are about. David, I, I, I will tell you really, really. Tell me another day, yeah. <laughs> Brian, oh, think God. Brian Blessed, Flash Gordon, and then look at Ian Brody. So <laughs> Google Gordon's Alive. Gordon's right. Alive. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm it's, it's very new to me as well. Eh? You know, that's, that's, my dear, that's my dear friend, David Gittos, the, the, the funniest man in the Northwest. All right. So the funniest man in the Northwest at Artemis Search. So thank you, David, for that contribution. Yeah. Um, Sorry, I've got to go. Yeah, yeah thank, thank, thank you everyone for staying as well. And... Bless, bless you for, for for hanging out with us, David. I'm going to kick you out if I can. So go. Um, and, I'll be on Snapchat. Yes, and that's what I was going to say to everyone. Follow these two guys. Find them. Connect with them. <laughs> tune into them. These guys. Don't follow me on Snapchat. I'm connected. <laughs> to people. That's it. Guy down the road and Gary Vaynerchuk. That's the yeah. only one. Get using it in your recruitment business. Is what I say. Use Snapchat. Just check. If that's you're right. Age range. Then people get on there. That's where there's people out there, and you could easily, you know, position people into jobs. Yeah, don't follow me, young guys. <laughs> Do it yourself. <laughs> Let, right. Catch everyone later. All right. Thanks, take care, everyone. Thanks ever so much for joining us here, Ian, and thank you. Bless you for coming through. That's all right, mate. My pleasure. My pleasure. As I say, I was going to be doing a workout at this time, so you've caused me immense pleasure for not, not having to have the beer. Go and do it now. It's never too late. Oh, no, it's tea time now. <laughs> Go and have some tea. I'll blame you. I'm yeah. going to tell my wife. A little oh, bit of chubbiness around the middle. It's, it's been right. on two hours. I feel like you've earned some tea now. Oh, yeah, fair enough. Fair right. enough. Listen, I've earned a beer, mate. I'm going to go off and get a beer. <laughs> Way ahead of you. Oh, <laughs> fantastic. Cheers, Ed. Take it easy. Bye, bye. Soon. Bless you. Bye. And everyone else that's still in the room, thank you so much for joining us. Really, really chuffed that you did. And some of you I know have just hung in there, stuck in there. There's still some great numbers. Um, if you've enjoyed this blab, um, do me a favor, just share it, okay? You can share it, you know, tweet a bird or whatever it is on the left hand side of your screens. Um, share it tomorrow as well because I think more and more recruiters should be using Blab. It's a great medium. This is our first time doing it, and I'm, I'm, it really worked. Apart from me getting kicked out and having to come back into the room, it did on the whole work. Um, and I hope you'll agree with me. We had some brilliant, brilliant experts um, uh, sharing and their generosity immense. Um, thank you very much. I can see a few of my friends in the room as well. I'm sorry if I didn't note you as you were coming through. Jonathan Foyne, I know that you're in the room. Uh, Wendy, actually, Wendy McDougall, I hope you haven't come back in. I know you were going to go and put one of your children to bed. Stephen O'Donnell, I, I, if you're still in the room, great, and thank you for hanging out with us, Stephen. Uh, I might need to do one of these things with you. David Walsh, I know that you turned up as a guest. Thank you. Olivia Lee, I know that, uh, that you were there too. So bless you. Thank you for turning out and. Um, I saw some claps there from you as well. So thank you very much. Uh, let me just see if I've missed anybody. Of course, I mentioned David Gittos. I think he may have left, but David, if you're still there, bless you. And Mohammed Razek, thank you very much, Mohammed, for uh, for hanging out with us. If I've missed anybody, I'm really sorry. Tune in. Make sure that you tune in tomorrow. We've got some fantastic more guests, not on Blab. Uh, look out for the email with the link to... Uh, all the different um, speakers tom tomorrow. D, who have we got on tomorrow? Uh, <laughs> check your email, okay? Check your email. Um, there's going to be two or three guests on, not on Blab, on their video interviews. Uh, some brilliant, brilliant content. All right, listen, I'm going to sign off. I'm going to have that beer that I, uh, I earn. Speak to you soon. Bye-bye.